I think this is the first time that the processing community is meeting at large to discuss what we are working on to meet each other. So I'm super, super happy about the first convening of the processing community. My name is Tiyun Choi. I'm the organizer of today. And um, on behalf of the board and all the organizers, I just want to really thank you for coming here. And I'll just say a brief a few things about the processing day, our schedule, and what uh, we should be doing for the rest of the day. So we designed the day around the theme of convening for the first time. And I would like to give you a background of where I come from. So I'm a co-founder and a teacher at the School for Poetic Computation, which is an artist-run school based in New York City. We teach computer programming, electronics, theory, and um, poetry, which is the most important part of things. And what I learned in organizing this um, alternative school for the past four plus years is that it really comes down to people. I think software comes after people. And it really comes down to the kind of people that you want to have around us that really inspire you and that really shape the culture of the work that you do. And I've learned that more chances that you have to meet other people who share the passion and who share this warm feeling for this very unique thing that we are excited about we are inspired and very empowered to go much further. And together, we can create something bigger. And together, we can create something more impactful. And for me, I think the processing represents something that uh, is really core to what makes technology and computers inspiring. So you might have noticed that that photo, one on the left, was used in our promotion. And there was not much of an explanation of what that photo is. So I'll give you insight on what those are. So that image is from uh, Signing Coders, which is a program that I ran with a group of uh, collaborators and friends uh, from the School for Poetic Computation. And it was, a it was a programming language workshop for people who are hard of hearing, deaf, and who are families of, the, of deaf people. So we worked with sign language interpreters and uh, many other assistants to, to transfer these um, programming concepts into sign language. So we use P5JS to use um, in the curriculum. And the image on the left is that, you know, in, in processing, the, this grid starts from 0, 0 at the top left at the top. And then it's like pixel, every pixel is like more numbers. So we're trying to uh, replicate that by uh, using this transparent sheet. So the person on the one side is gesturing to move the pixel. And then the person on the other side is using a marker to trace and then color those in. So this is a way of using computers to communicate beyond languages. And this is the exciting part about computer programming in general, is that it's a language that could potentially not discriminate. It's a language that could go beyond borders and to uh, be a, a language that are shared among people with different interests, um, different ideas, and different directions, different uh, cultures as well. So the, I've been asked to join the uh, Board of Advisors at the Processing Foundation a few years ago. And I've been working with an amazing team to think about um, educational initiatives, curatorial initiatives such as a Learning to Teach conference in New York City, which we'll do um, in January. Um, in collaboration with Tiga Brain, who's here, we've been um, organizing this conference for teachers. And um, I hope you can join that as well. And we've been also doing a lot of work to think about what is the community aspects of processing that could, we could improve? What is something that is absolutely necessary for us to make this a bit more inclusive and uh, useful for people like um, people around us? So we got inspired to do this day, uh, Processing Community Day, uh, here at MIT Media Lab. And there's a few people that I definitely need to thank, because they were the real uh, force behind making this possible. So Fathom Information Design, a company uh, founded by Ben Fry, who is um, one of the founders of Processing, um, their team, including Daniel Freeman, Olivia Glignon, and, um, and all of these amazing people were the, so fundamental to making this possible. And um, their, their time and their expertise and their warm heart to bring this community together to this day has been the inspiration and the real work behind um, making this possible. So I just want to give a round of applause for Fadim, folks. 
And definitely MIT Media Lab for hosting us, giving this opportunity and the, the space. Um, School for Poetic Computation for their, um, the staff. A, a lot of the volunteers today are from the School for Poetic Computation, so you'll get to meet them. The Frank Rachi Studio for Creative Inquiry from the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, their generous support has allowed us to invite you to after party with um, free drinks. So big, <laughs> big thanks to Frank Rachi Studio and Colin Levin, who's here. And Rafik Anwar Studio, so they are based in LA. Um, he's a, the founder is a student of Casey Rees at UCLA DMA, and they were really generous in supporting us as well. As well as the uh, University of Denver's Emergent uh, Digital Practice Program. And uh, Chris Coleman is here. He's gonna give a, a lightning talk later as well. And NYU IDM, um, attendant School of Engineering, um, brought many of their students and also supported us. And last but not the least, ITP uh, NIU's program at the Tisch School of the Arts um, have supported many of uh, the speakers and um, supported the processing project overall over the years. So these are some of the um, supporters who I want to thank. But most importantly, I want to thank you for coming um, today and coming to meet every, one, every other of you. And just to give you a rundown of what the day is going to feel like. So we have a panel discussion slash kind of a story time from the processing board of directors. <laughs> and we are going to transition to a fellows talk. So the morning session will be highlighting some of the processing foundation fellows, Google Summer, Summer of Code fellows. And um, they will talk about their research and development, their art practice. So that will run until noon. At noon, we're gonna have lunch. Um, there's some lunch prepared outside, and we have this thing called lunchtime focus group. And I'm actually tempted to call it lunchtime unfocus group, because um, it's, it's an opportunity for you to meet other um, practitioners, leaders in this field, and just have lunch with them. And you can also like swap lunch uh, seats and go to different places. And we have Golan Levin and Jose Luis from, um, from Harvard, and then Chris Coleman, Tiga Brain, who's gonna be the lunchtime focus group leaders. But um, it's basically kind of a tables, and there's no pr actual program in that lunchtime focus group, so you could just meet each other. There's also area for uh, show and tell. Um, if you brought your laptop or, or your project, you could just show your projects to other people. And we have some demos uh, that are getting set up for lunchtime as well. At one, uh, we're gonna change the mode and go into two tracks. So the, this room, the main room, is gonna be um, two amazing speakers that I'm so thrilled to have. The first speaker, uh, her name's Eva Diaz. She's an art historian and a professor at Pratt University. She writes about um, artist communities and independent institutions such as the Black Mountain College which is this really unique moment in history of art, engineering, dance, and ar architecture, and all these interdisciplinary practitioners to coming together to create a new models of making and sharing, the, sharing their knowledge. So um, she'll talk about Black Mountain College, and I've actually not seen her talk in real life, but I've seen many videos and have read her book. And it just seems like this is what we need to contextualize some of what we are trying to do as a community at large. So we've invited Eva for, uh, for a talk here. And there's going to be a Q&A session as well. Uh, for after a 20 minute break, so we designed this transition breaks in between the talks just to give you time to relax and also meet each other. Um, 20 minutes later, Daniel Schiffman is going to do coding train live on stage. So <laughs> it's kind of a oxymoron because coding train is always live, but it's never on stage. So I've successfully convinced Dan to sort of do a live version of the uh, coding train, his YouTube channel for learning code. Um, at the same time, we're going to have a parallel track on in the auditorium. So that's just right next door. It's an auditorium. Uh, when, when you get out of the elevator, it's the first thing on your right. So there will be um, the first um, inclusive online communities workshop um, by um, Johanna Heva and then Sidat Harry. So Johanna is the director of advocacy at the Processing Foundation. She's a performance artist and a activist writer, um, really inspiring person who I think will give you a sense of what processing as an online and physical community could be in the future, and how can we be more welcoming for people who are different. 
and see that Harry is an editor at large at Coral Project and also at Mozilla. And she has a lot of experience thinking about on online communication spaces and kind of like how we, how we can talk nice to each other <laughs> online. I, I think there's a lot of things that all of you could learn from that workshop. And I think there's a lot of things that we are not sure um, as a community what to do. And I think this is gonna be a really special moment to just see uh, what other uh, small but most important things that we should consider when we're communicating and building a community together. There will be a sign-up sheet for this workshop um, in the information um, booth. Uh, we, have a we have a space for 30 people, and um, I, would like you to I would like to encourage you to sign up during the breaks. And, and also, after um, that workshop, there's an information design workshop by FATM Information Design. So FATM's uh, designers and engineers will show you how they visualize data and work on this very complex and elegant visualization of uh, data sets. So that's a hands-on workshop, and you will learn to you know, use some of the toolkits that they've been building. So, so there, that's the two tracks. And while I'm like super excited about all the big talks that's happening here, um, that's gonna be recorded by video and we're gonna publish it on our foundation site. At the workshops, it's much difficult to capture in, in video format. So we're gonna try to document as much as possible with photo and notes. But um, I, th I would also encourage you to try the workshop session if, if you can find time to check out the videos later on. So that's uh, one special opportunity. And after another 20 minutes break, uh, we are gonna have our highlight of the day, which is the a lightning talk by the community. So we had an open call from uh, every one of you. We asked the participants and they're gonna sh share what they're working on. And I'm just super excited about what they have brought into uh, to the program. So that's the end of the day. And we'll have some cookies and coffee for reception outside. And at six to eight, or possibly later, uh, we're gonna have kind of a happy hour after, um, after party at Mead Hall, which is um, about 10 minutes away at Kendall. Um, it's a bar, it's a second floor, so you'll see some of us there. So I think that's the program of the day. The hashtag is uh, PCD17. We're trying to get PCD2017 but it was taken by Point City Dolphins, <laughs> which is, a, I think it was, it's like a hockey team in Point City. So we got PCD 17, and yeah. On that note, I wanna incur, um, invite the board of the Processing Foundation. Hi everybody, um, I'm Casey. It's I'm really Please, thrilled to be here today. Here's, your, here's a mic. Beyond thrilled to be here today. Um, it's a really important day for us. Um, and it's really our hope that it will be an important day for you. Um, the idea is to, is to come together, to meet new people, to share ideas. Um, also, hopefully, to connect with friends as well. Um, when we first start pro started processing, um, Ben Fry and myself, back in the olden times, um, the primary aspiration was really to bring coding to a new audience of people. And at that time, um, in 2001, the audience of new people we were interested in um, reaching was a community of artists and designers, a community that previously hadn't really embraced coding as a way of making work, as a way of expressing themselves and, and communicating. And so from that original aspiration, we set out to, to begin work. Um, and this all happened in, in the building next to this building, um, the original Media Lab building. And so we're just, we're really thrilled today to be here to, to share this first day together as a group. One thing I want to say too, which I normally wouldn't say at all before I begin a talk, is that I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and I think we're all a little bit nervous um, because it's the first day of its kind. And it's also our hope, I mean, in, in saying that, it's, it's sort of a, an, hopefully an opening that today will hopefully be a little bit more, will be a little informal than a typical conference or presentation. This will be a lot of dialogue and back and forth. Um, but we're gonna begin by being a little bit formal, standing at the podium, saying a few things. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of, that's just my way. 
Um, so we're going we're gonna to dig into it. Um, so Ben and I met in 1999. Um, he moved to Boston in 1998 to be here at the MIT Media Lab to join the Aesthetics and Computation Group. And so the year that Ben joined the Aesthetics and Computation Group, Golan Levin and Elise Ko also joined the group. Um, the year that I joined, the year after, Jared Schiffman joined. So there were, there were six people in that group. We worked really closely together. Um, we, we met and we really made friends for life. It was very tight. Um, and I think the most important thing about that group, for me, was that we taught each other, that we shared ideas um, openly, um, we were very honest with each other, um, and we also shared all of our technical knowledge with each other. And that was really this aim of the processing project, was to um, bring that out of this lab and into the world at, at, a, at a different scale, to allow people to learn something maybe they thought they couldn't learn before, to make it more accessible, and then allow other people to share. And as a community that we teach each other and we, we sort of build this field um, in a collaborative, open way. That was really the initial aspiration of the project. So all of us came to MIT to study with this gentleman, this brilliant person, um, John Maeda. Um, there's not a chance that we would all be in this room together today without his vision, his vision in the 1990s of how to bring together the world of visual exploration with the world of computer science. And so I just wanted you to clearly see John, because um, <laughs> he is the reason. This is a photo of Ben checking his email in 1999. Um, it's actually a video, but there's not a lot of motion going on. Um, this is how we spent our two years together, basically, um, in a dark room, um, staring at screens. And this is, this is the glamorous origin of the processing project. So. My first year here at MIT, and been second, uh, John Maeda pulled us into this project. This project was called Design by Numbers. And Design by Numbers was a really elegant system for exploring coding within the framework of traditional graphic design education and the field of graphic design. And so what you see there is 100 by 100 pixels. You can see that you have access to 256 gray values. And this was the world that you learned to code within. And so, as John does, he really got us involved deeply um, and collaborating together. And this is a worksheet that I made up when Ben Fry and myself and Elise Co went to RISD in 2000 to teach within the graphic design program there, uh, Design by Numbers. And so you can see how this language is built. We have words like paper, words like pen. We have values from 0 to 100. And it was, this could be a really long story, but I'm not going to make it into a long story. Um, ben and I worked on this project intensely, and this was really the, um, one of the frameworks that was the inspiration for processing. Processing is a direct descendant from this DBN, Design by Numbers, programming environment. So the, the biggest goal here is to bring what we find really fascinating and have deep passion for within the world of the arts and what we find fascinating and have deep passion for within the worlds of computing. And how do we make a new culture out of um, synthesizing these together? I think the radical notion here for me is that as visual people, as creators, it's not enough to learn how to use software. We need to learn how to create software. We don't need to, but we want to. I think that's a much better way to put it. We want to learn how to do this. Um, for example, instead of just editing photos on the computer, what if we could imagine like reinvent what photography could be? What if we could re-explore ways of seeing, not by emulating old tools like a darkroom in software or a drafting board in software, but what if we could imagine new ways of, of constructing and new ways of exploring media? And for me, that's the reason, my personal reason of why um, writing code is an exciting thing to do. So the primary idea here is that we start sketching. And we move from sketching which for me is thinking, um, into sketching and code, which the code then produces visual works. And so the idea of sketching and code is a fundamental idea to the origins of the processing project, that you can have an idea, write code quickly, and see results quickly. This is a um, photocopy of my sketchbook from 2001 when Ben and I were sitting next door and thinking about what processing can be. And one of the original conversations was how can we treat 
the foundation program, sort of in visual design education, but through the framework of thinking about software. And so we have a lot of these original ideas of um, color and form, but also time and space, and how we can do this um, in a way that makes sense in 2000. 2001 was definitely the future. Um, and so how, did, what, how would we like, redefine this for 2001? And so at the time, we were really frustrated because this is how we needed to do our work. This is a program, of course you can't read that, but you can see the length of it. This is a program to draw one single triangle to the screen. And this is the part of the program that actually draws that triangle to the screen. And if we wanted to draw a triangle to the screen, we didn't want to have to have all that extra overhead and this amount of specification. And so we took our inspiration from prior programming languages, languages that grew out of the 1960s and this idea that programming is not for specialists, it's for generalists, it's for everybody. And so these are two programs that draw a triangle. The top one is in basic and the, and the lower one is in logo. This was where we, our heads were at. This is what we were ex more excited by. And so we wanted to move away from this, which is a first, programming, first program that you would often see in a Java programming class. We wanted to move from that to this. So the shift here is twofold. One is that you're able to focus on what you really want to do, in this case, draw a line. And the second is that you don't want to do math or you don't want to um, work with text. You want to make images. And of course, we do want to work with math and work with text, but the kind of the beginning of this was that you would start visually. And all the kinds of things that you would learn in a computer science class about variables, about functions, about loops, you would do that through images rather than through the, the decades of tradition of working with text and, and numbers. So when we started processing, this was really the vision. The vision was to be able to write these short programs that would then have a visual counterpart. So this is a movie that I'll just let run for a moment. It gives you a sense of the first kinds of things that we made with processing in the origin. Working with images, working with geometry, working with time, working with interactivity. Very focused on the screen at the beginning. But what happened after was really unexpected and really exciting. And it really cuts to the core of this idea of community. Ben and I had some assumptions about what we wanted to do with processing, but a lot of other people had other ideas about what they wanted to do, um, things that we had never imagined. And so one of the early um, uh, pieces of soft code that was written for processing was a library system that allowed other people to write code, contribute it back to the community to document that code, and then people could do other things that, um, for example, these things on the list, interfacing with different hardware, working with video, working with audio, et cetera. Um, things beyond that original scope, really driven by the community and hopefully curated and encouraged through, through, the, through the original work. And so that led to projects like this, uh, Michael Hansmeier first working in software and then using processing to create geometry to make physical things. That led to projects like this, which is Philip Stern's um, producing textiles, which every, of course has a, an origin in computing too, but it's nice to connect back to it. And projects like this um, from Nervous System, where simulation code is written and then um, uh, CNC'd and then slipcast to make these exquisite ceramic objects. And so this is a slide from the archive, and it's basically an, an origin of, of, the, of the, um, the software, where we have advanced frameworks that were written here at the Media Lab before Ben and I were here. Um, we have Bad Windows by Bob Saviston, AC Windows by David Small. These are people who were engaged with the Visual Language Workshop. Bob was in the VLW, right? The Visual Language Workshop here, which was the research group before the Aesthetics and Computation group that Ben and I were a part of. And then we have AC World, uh, Tom White, Jared Schiffman, and Ben Fry, and then ACU. And so that, all those ideas came into processing, as well as ideas from sketching and prototyping environments, often used by designers. And then the education really came out of the Design by Numbers project by John Maeda. And then so years later, we're kind of here. Um, we're in Denver a number of years ago uh, working on Processing 3. And so Processing 3 is our, our newest piece of software, um, and it continues to be updated on a daily, weekly basis. Um, and this, this chart sort of shows where it fits in with other programming languages. And also, of course, we're extremely excited about the, the projects that have spun out of Processing as well. Um, 
the extraordinary P5.js led by Lauren McCarthy, processing.py led by Jonathan Feidberg, who are, Lauren, hello. <laughs> and Jonathan's gonna be speaking here later today too. Here's a few bullet points to sum up things that didn't really fit into that short discussion, but these, this idea of getting out of the lab and into the world, you know, taking things from this rare environment and, and trying to open it up to a much larger group. Um, that processing from the very beginning was a language and environment that were intertwined, so they were kind of no friction between the two, That's, that was the aim. And then community was always an early focus, um, but that community was, a, was an online community, it was an international community. And I think the radical notion of today, which we're so excited about, um, is that we can also um, hopefully foster local community too, um, and meet in real life, meet face to face, which is something we haven't done until today, 16 years later. So I think that's one reason why we're nervous and excited about today. Um, this is a chart of number of people using processing over since, um, where do we start? I guess we started counting this in 2006. Um, and this takes us up to 2015. Um, and you, so this is something that is a part of the project, is how do we scale? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, and this idea of bringing floss into the arts, free, libre, open source software, which of course has a really firm foot within technical communities, but it's really unknown within the arts, where a few companies um, are really controlling the software that we use for producing our work. Um, with that, I'm going to say that a few years after we started the project, we had the really good fortune of meeting Dan Schiffman. And here, we're at a bed and breakfast in Indiana when we were um, doing a development like session. Sometimes we'll like fly to the same place and like work on code for a few days. And we were doing this at Oxford University in Miami, Ohio, but our, our bed and breakfast was in Indiana. Dan. Uh, thank you, Casey. Hello, I'm also a little bit nervous. I'm used to talking to in, in a room by myself with just a camera. So this is like actual people in front of me. Um, so what do I do here? Press the down arrow, goes to the next slide. Okay, so I wanna talk um, about how I came to the processing project. And I think I can say that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for uh, Red Burns, who I consider to be uh, a mentor um, and an inspiration for me. She was the, she's, was the founder of the ITP program where I teach currently at Tisch School of the Arts in uh, New York University. Um, uh, Red started working with technology in, um, in the 70s, and that's her on the left there with the uh, Sony Portipac camera. And, and, and to me, what I learned from Red is that community comes first. You know, technology, software comes second. And um, what Red started to do is say, hey, look at this video camera. What if we put it th this in the hands of the community? What could be done? And, and, and she led workshops in Washington Heights uh, at, with the uh, community there to use port pack camera to convince the city to add a traffic light. And if you don't know about the other work that she did in the 70s and 80s and 90s and all the way through the 2000s, you should uh, learn about her. But I, um, this is how I think of Red. That's a photo of her in her office at ITP when I was first a student there. Um, I was always very nervous to go back there and talk to her. Uh, she was an intimidating force of nature, but also the kindest and, and sweetest person. Um, and so uh, when I teach an introduction to programming course at ITP, I always try to remember, uh, actually, I didn't bring it with me, but there's a lovely book of quotes from Red that you should find if you can, if you can find it. Um, but I always really think of these two quotes from her, which is the way I, I have to I w w read them to remind myself at the beginning of a semester, um, which is consider the technology as a tool which in itself could do nothing. Treat the technology as something that everyone on the team could learn, understand, and explore freely. And this has all, always been a theme in my head, but I think I didn't fully learn about all of the pieces of that um, until I started working on processing it over the years, meeting so many different people with different perspectives. Um, this is ITP. Uh, uh, that's me at 2003 when I graduated from ITP. I put an error there. You can play Where, Where's Waldo for the bottom one try to find me, so for, that's from last spring. I think probably there are people in the audience here who are in this photo, I would assume. Maybe even in the top one. Um, this is uh, the first known 
<laughs> as far as I know, uh, instance of processing being taught at ITP. This was when I was a student there. JT Nimoy led a workshop. I believe it was called something like Processing for Macro Media Director Minds or something like that. At the time, we were using the Lingo programming language in Macro Media Director to uh, that's the course that I took when I uh, introduction to computational media with that environment. Um, and so this is a workshop that uh, JT uh, Nimoy led where I discovered processing. Um, this is Amit Pitaru who was teaching a class called Code and Me also around the same time. That's the ITP website that I dug up from, I guess that's from 2004, it looks like. Um, and uh, I think that I couldn't find the course description that says processing in it. I could only find the one that says Flash. So Amit was teaching with Flash, and processing sort of seeped into the ITP curriculum via JT Nimoy's workshop and Amit's course. Um, and then Dan O'Sullivan, who uh, I like to quote him too. They don't call variables memorables. Um, he's got some good quotes as well. Uh, the creator of Dan's apartment, he's uh, uh, has been around ITP for a long time and is currently the chair of ITP and, and dean of emerging media at Tisch. I think he's the one who said to me, hey, why don't you teach a class? Because I was kind of looking at processing right around when I graduated. And the course that I taught is what's called, and it was just his name. I never liked this name. I just want to put, put that out there now. Called, uh, maybe it's a good name, actually. Maybe now I like it. But uh, procedural painting. Um, and this was like a trial run to see like, well, what would it mean if we used processing uh, as, a, as, a, as a platform to teach people from a, all backgrounds who had never seen code before to learn to code for the first time and kind of build out that chart of all the different pieces of things that are possible. So I, I found this amazingly on my computer, this tutorial where I, I, I had so, wrote something about programming is the process of creating steps for a computer to perform a desired task. Let's say you needed to program your computer to feed your cat. So I don't know why I thought that was a good example. I haven't used it since. Um, but this was the first tutorial, I think, that I probably wrote uh, in 2004. And I, I, I just found it on my computer and uploaded it to a GitHub uh, repository. So everyone wants to take a look at it. There it is. Uh, thank you to. Uh, Jonathan Coram for the CSS that I borrowed from his website, I believe, back in 2004. Um, and I also was able to dig up and find um, this post that I made on April 27th, 2005, um, to the Processing Forums, where I you know, essentially wrote a post saying, hey, I love, I love processing. This is what I'm doing with it. Can I be involved? And I, I want to kind of come back to this and, um, and, and, and um, think about the next steps and think about community here. What, um, so, um, we, and what I want to say here is I think something that I've learned over the years is I made this post in 2005 feeling like happy and comfortable that this is a place for me and I'm just going to make this post and I found my way into getting involved in processing. And something that I've really learned about over the years is what does it, is, are, is an online forum, is a GitHub repository, is a class, is that a comfortable place for everybody and what pieces are missing in terms of bringing more people, a more diverse, inclusive communities into the processing project. And so somebody that I learned a lot about that from is Lauren McCarthy, uh, who I'm going to introduce next, um, who created the P5JS project and she's gonna tell you about that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. OK. So I'm supposed to tell the story of P5JS. And uh, one time I ran a few part, the st parts of the story by Casey and it included some quotes from him. And he sort of denied saying any of it. Um, so, but the, flo the story flows better if I just say that he did. So anytime you hear like Casey said, just imagine like Casey probably said something and like Lauren in her own world interpreted and then the quote. Um, so that's just my disclaimer. OK. So. Uh, my story starts, I think, in 2012, and I was at uh, I.O., a conference in Minneapolis, and I heard Zach Lieberman, who is the, one of the creators of Open Frameworks, talk on a panel about open source tools. And they were saying a bunch of stuff, but at one point I heard, um, you know, if you're a woman, like, we don't have a lot of them here right now, but there's a spot at the table here for you, too. And before that moment, I hadn't ever thought about contributing to open source. It hadn't crossed my mind. I hadn't realized I wanted to be a part of it, um, mostly because I didn't really re consider that I could. So his words kind of started me on something that I'm still on today. And I think back to it a lot because I realize how significant and necessary that clear, expli explicit invitation can be. I wouldn't have even thought of it if he hadn't explicitly invited. So I began trying to get involved in some of these communities. I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna get into open source. Uh, I joined some mailing lists, and I realized really quickly that like, 
it was sort of a, a lot of times a space where you had to just like uh, kind of force your way in or prove yourself. Um, sometimes I would get a response. I'd be like, oh, I'm here. I want to be involved. And it was kind of like, oh, you could answer some questions on the forum. And I wanted to, I wanted to write code. And I realized it wasn't like something personally against me, but just that that was sort of the standard that you kind of prove yourself before people take you seriously in these spaces. Um, and I thought, well, what do you do if like, maybe you feel like a little bit of an outsider in the space already, you feel uncomfortable, and like, the last thing I'm gonna do is just like elbow my way in and say like, oh, I'm supposed to be here. Um, so I sort of gave up until I ran into Casey Reese um, at another conference, and I sort of mentioned this to him, and I, I was saying like, I wish there was something I could do to change things. I wish that like, I didn't feel so out of place just being like a woman in the space, um, but I don't feel like I have some like, I'm gonna go be like some activist or I have some plan like that, I don't know what to do. And, and he said, or I interpreted, um, <laughs> well, you know, maybe you don't need a whole plan. Like you could just try and get involved if you, if you get a chance and maybe, you know, just, just do something. Just be one more person working in this space and maybe, you know, maybe one day others will follow your example, but at the very least you're one more. And so I thought, okay, yeah, you know, if I get a chance. And so a week later, that chance came when he said, he sent me an email, hey, so you want to work on processing? And I felt like after my whole rant, like I couldn't say no at this point. So uh, I, was, I was going for it. Um, and so the idea was that he and Dan and Ben invited me to do uh, a processing fellowship. And uh, my charge was to imagine what processing might look like today or might look like for the web maybe. Um, and it was, it was supposed to be just sort of like a three month re research project. And so I thought, okay, cool. This is my big chance, like my big in, I'm going, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be an open source, like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And so I set about and I did um, nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like just nothing for like at least three months. Um, and uh, yeah, it was cause I was, I was scared. I didn't know. I didn't really understand the question. I was too scared to ask for clarification. I think I did and I still didn't understand the problem. Um, so I just kept doing nothing and feeling really kind of lame. Um, until I think one day Casey emailed me and said, so about that fellowship, are you uh, <laughs> gonna do anything? And so I was like, oh, uh, okay. Uh, and he said, well, why don't you just, you know, just try something, just, just try a little experiment, you know? that same idea, just try something. You don't need a whole plan. And uh, do by next week if you could. Uh, <laughs> so the deadline was also helpful. Um, and so from there, so I did, I tried something. I started um, just trying to get some things up on the screen. These are some of the first uh, screenshots just showing like, oh look, I can, I can put text up there. I can make colors. Um, and from there it started to take a little bit more form and it sort of organically developed into a much larger project. Um, at some point, I felt really excited because I could also draw a circle and a rectangle just like you could in processing and figured like I was like halfway there. Um, <laughs> uh, little did I know. Um, and so, but while I was doing this, this the question, right, was like what, would process, what might processing look like if it were kind of invented today? And so the first ideas were, well, we would use HTML5 and JavaScript instead of Java. Um, but there was this other idea which was why not take you know, diversity and inclusivity as a core value? And I was looking around and seeing so many projects that were kind of having this realization now and thinking like, oh, how do I kind of add this into this project that's already going? And I was like, here's a chance to, what happens if we really state that and try to make design decisions based on that? You know, with, towards the goal that like other people coming to this project shouldn't have to elbow their way in. What if we make this explicit rather than just something implicit maybe or hopeful? So, you know, maybe instead of uh, hacker sessions or devel developer sessions that look like this, they could look more like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is a little bit of a joke, but I had to put this up here um, because uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Evelyn Eastman, who was my collaborator through the beginning of this project. Um, and uh, none of this would be here without her. Um, we didn't always have champagne, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but no, really, it looked more like this, I think. And the idea is that, y you know, you didn't, ha my big thing was, like, you don't have to be an expert, you know, and this is coming from processing, too. You don't, ha you shouldn't have to elbow your way in. Just being interested and willing to learn should be enough. You know, let's take uncertainty and acknowledgement of what we don't yet understand as a starting point. 
And this idea that like no tool is neutral. Tools are embedded with the beliefs, the desires, and the biases of its creators. If we're talking about a tool for creative expression, it becomes really critical that we have a lot of voices in the process of making that tool. It can't just be a few developers that make all the decisions. We, so we're thinking, like, how do we expand the possible uses? We ask, what else might we want to express? Whose views are represented here? And can we throw out some of our ideas about how software is supposed to work and see what comes out instead? Um, uh, so the, I wanted to mention, so there's one slide that I left out. I sort of forgot it. And I think it's really telling and really special that I forgot it. And it would be um, Kyle McDonald. So around this time, uh, maybe we're in the black dark space when I was there, um, I tracked down one of the core contributors of Open Frameworks, Kyle and I uh, would buy him meals in exchange for him helping me figure out how to get myself out of this situation. Um, and this continued, and I realized eventually I needed so much help that I just like married him. Um, so I could like, have him always on call. Um, but it's really telling, and so many times I kind of begged him to be a part of the project, and I was like, look, you could be like a project lead on this with me, and he always refused. And um, and he, he said, it's, I can't do that because like, there's a chance then that it wouldn't be your project, that it could be mine, and I don't want that. Um, and so I think that idea, you know, the, so much, he has given so much to this project, yet I forget to put a slide of him in here. And I think that, um, and just keep that in your mind as we're talking about how we support each other. It's, it's interesting that he didn't feel like he had to put his name on this thing. Um, so anyway, one, one other story, story within a story here. Um, I can't help but think of the first contributors conference that took place in 2015 as we're gathered here for processing community day. Um, so in 2015, Golan Levin approached me and offered to host the P5JS contributors conference. And I was like, okay, cool, let's do it. You know, anyone that's interested should be welcome. I'm gonna invite them. You don't have to be an expert programmer. Uh, heck, some of these people don't even know how to code at all or just learned like last week, this is gonna be great. Um, and there were all these people that wanted to come, so we kept like spreading our budget and suddenly like 30 people are all convening in Pittsburgh. Um, and it was like the day before, I was just like, oh my God, like what's, I, what is gonna happen? Like how am I gonna do this? I can't like individually help each one of these people like, you know, figure out GitHub or something. And I just had no idea how it was gonna work. Um, but it was the same thing, right? We just tried something. We sat down, we started passing the mic around, we started sharing our ideas. Um, we kind of broke into groups organically and picked the things that excited us. And we had a few rules. Um, I think Taeyun Choi suggested a few of these. One of them was, you know, you could wear headphones, but you had to be willing to stop and be asked a question at any time. And you had to be willing to engage with that question and, and not act like it was an annoyance or say that you were too busy. Um, and then the other part was that we were um, really certain that we wanted every part of the work that we were doing to be kind of considered equally. You know, the people that are working on writing up a, a community code of conduct, or the people that are working on documentation or education, or are just as highly, you know, important as the people that are writing the core code of the graphics engine or something like that. Um, so just cr creating that sort of balance between everyone. Um, and I remember this moment where I looked over and I saw like one uh, participant who, one contributor who had just learned how to um, submit a pull request on GitHub, teaching someone else how to do it. And I felt like, okay, this is, this is possible, right? That being interested and being willing to learn is enough. It really is if you let it be. Um, over half the people there made their first contribution to open source. Um, so it was some stuff like this. Um, this is a little bit hard to read, but this is Stephanie Pai talking about, we think maybe it's about hard work, but what about mentorship? And bef beyond, before that even, what about access? Um, Emily Chen went and talked with many of the women in the uh, Python community and brought back some of her observations. And this is one that we took really seriously. Just don't assume that anyone has to know anything. Um, and we tried to take all these ideas and make it really explicit in our community statement. It's online if you didn't get all the way through it. Um, and then one more place we were thinking a lot about this was our, in terms of communication. And one space where um, this is often a problem is GitHub. Um, so uh, a lot of times the conversation can be uh, 
a little bit tense or a little bit like trying to prove yourself. And um, this is an example of someone that posts on GitHub. So a lot of times when you have a question and it's like uh, maybe the, a beginner and they're just learning and they've maybe used the tool incorrectly. So a lot of times this gets shut down immediately, like RTFM, read the manual. Um, but in this case, this got posted, someone, uh, and you can't read it at all really, but someone immediately responds and sort of helps them figure out the solution, but then someone else says, but hey, like the fact that you didn't understand, maybe there's a problem with the documentation, or maybe there's something we could do with the library to make that more clear. Someone else submits a pull request and changes that and gives these warning messages for uh, beginners. Um, and then the person ends up at the end saying like, wow, you know, actually, uh, I feel like I've, maybe I've done something useful. I've actually contributed open source by posting this question. And I think that's, that's like a, such a win. Um, so I should wrap this up here. Um, I wanted to end with this quote that um, Chandler McWilliams shared at the conference from Walt Wiltman. And for me, it's about paying attention and listening to people, being curious about what they're doing, how they're doing, and how you can work with them better. I think these things go so long, such a long way. It's about showing up. It's about being present. And I think about presence, you know, this idea of showing up, but also this idea of stepping back in the way that, you know, Kyle did, or in the way that Ben and Casey and Dan actually gave me a part of their project and let me do what I want with it. It's about passing the mic, which I should do soon. So this is a super cut um, that thank Sam you. Levine thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank made. You. Thank you. Uh, thanks. 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 And this thank is all the ITP you. students thank you. Um, thank saying thank you, thank you at the end of their thank thesis you. presentation, thank thanking you. all the people thank that helped them. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you. I think this idea thank of this brilliant thank singular thank artist is something we hold on our minds, but we see at ITP and also in this processing community that we're part of is acknowledgement that we follow each other, that we we build on each other's tools, ideas, words mistakes and projects we borrow remix remake and reinterpret we don't always have a big plan but we're not afraid to just try something and try it with others thanks thanks okay thank you uh, Casey is coming back now <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Johanna uh, by way of basically saying We've been doing a lot of software development for a lot of years, um, and sort of the, the community grew, um, the code base grew, and it just was entirely out of control. Um, and so we had the, the notion of um, establishing the foundation back in 2012 as a way to um, assist with this, as a way to fundraise, as a way to organize. And so here's the paperwork. This was the, like the most important piece of paper in the last decade for me. Um, <laughs> where we were officially granted nonprofit status. Um, this came in 2015 and then was retroactive to 2012. Uh, it took like two years to go through that. But this really enabled so much to happen in our project that we weren't able to do before. A lot of ideas of community being foregrounded, advocacy being foregrounded, that we didn't have the bandwidth before. We were now building a structure to enable that to happen. So these are the software projects that the foundation supports uh, at the moment, like our resources go in this way. The processing project plus the Raspberry Pi version, which Godfrey will talk about later, p5.js, uh, processing.py, which Jonathan will talk about later, and processing for Android, which Andres will talk about later. But then also, what was new with the foundation was the community initiatives that began. Things like our open call for fellowships, which were going to be um, going into our third year this year, things like the p5.js developers conference and uh, these, these sorts of events. And so a new thing that happened with the foundation was also bringing Johanna into the project and all the extraordinary um, energy and ideas that she's brought as well. So I'm gonna introduce Johanna. Um, I don't have any other slides. So you'll just have to look at my face twice. Um, oh, there's another one of my face? Oh. Well, then let's go back to that. <laughs> um, so I came um, to the project uh, kind of similarly to Lauren in that I ran into Casey. Um, and uh, he was like, so what are you up to? And I was like, oh, I just graduated, you know, my grad school program. And uh, to pay, pay the bills, I'm writing grants for artists and nonprofits within the art world. 
And Casey was like, oh, I've got a new nonprofit and we need, we need money. <laughs> but we don't really know, you know, uh, what exactly for, how to get it, what we want to do with it, you know, these kinds of uh, bigger existential questions. And I was like, well, why don't we, yeah, we could try to write some grants and see what we can do. And my situation is that um, I first met Casey and Lauren at UCLA when I was an undergraduate student at the DMA program. And I came there very, um, I'm like the classic failure story of um, I really wanted to be in science. And I was majoring in uh, physics, actually. And I received just no welcome at all from the dudes in the lab. You know, I would show up with my code homework, my math homework, and I would try to be working it out. And they would be like, well, you couldn't have worked that out on your own, you know. Very, very classic stories of not feeling invited, not feeling included, and imposter, imposter syndrome. So I started to move away into the art uh, field, and I found DMA, which seemed like a good little hybrid. And one of the first classes I took was um, basically intro to interactivity and coding. And it was taught by Chandler McWilliams, who I think is, should be mentioned here many times. Um, and then I took a class with Casey that um, really felt very different from anything else I had ever done with code or computers or the internet or anything. So by the time I ran into him at the library, I had a bit of a background in it, but I was going off in these other directions of doing performance art, um, very weird performance art, you know, like an adaptation, a queer adaptation of Homer's Odyssey performed in a Honda Odyssey, <laughs> being driven down the freeway in LA, and like the, you know, the like director notes before we would go every night was like, okay, if the police pull us over, just like don't break character. <laughs> so coming into the processing community was, you know, obviously a kind of a weird fit. I was like, what am I doing here? Um, but I have to say that it's one of the most supportive communities that I've ever been involved in, even though I always feel like an outsider. I still feel like an outsider today. Um, but that, I think that spirit is in the project already, and it became one of the core values of the foundation as we started to move forward, thinking about what we could do with um, the scale of having a nonprofit foundation. So here I go now to this slide. I think the idea with the foundation has become if we have already a long and robust history of software development and have become a real force of nature within the open source community, software development community, and the art community, what can we do in nonprofit terms, which usually translates to social, civic impact? What can we do with that? Our influence already in these other places, and now we can direct it very explicitly, very, you know, intentionally to do something socially. So we do a couple of things. I um, am mainly involved in the advocacy and outreach part, and a lot of it is just me sitting around thinking like, how can we make this community feel welcoming and inviting to people who might not already feel welcome? So when I'm talking to my friends who might not know about what processing is or P5 is, I'm like, you know, like if you're not a straight white boy who already has a MacBook Pro, like, you know, you're also welcome. <laughs> Some of my best friends are straight white boys with MacBook <laughs> Pros. <laughs> so that's sort of in a nutshell what I do for um, the foundation. And I think that, um, you know, the main thing that I'm going to be saying a lot today is that it's not only okay if you're an outsider, it's really, really valuable. And as anybody who works in any kind of creative expression, whether that's using technology and the internet and your computer to do that, or using paint or words, you know that to have a different perspective from the norm and the normative is very important. So I think that that is like one of the things that, 
yeah, if there's a theme of what I'm going to be talking about in general today and about my work here, it's that it's not just okay to not know or be an outsider or not feel comfortable, to have imposter syndrome, all of that. It's not just that's normal. It's, it's really valuable to us. So we're all here today maybe feeling different levels of that, you know, feeling like an outsider, feeling like this is new. We're all nervous. And I think that that's like one of the most exciting parts of this is that we're figuring it out as we're going along. And we want to thank you so much for being along for the bumpy ride. Yeah, but um, but I do want to maybe get just one one question from the audience, maybe just just oh. as a symbolic thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone have a burning questions? <laughs> Hi there. Hey guys. Um, thanks for having us. This is super cool. Um, I my first question is why now? Like why today? Uh, you know, not like today today, but you know, why not when processing was an earlier version? and was working on some of the earlier Raspberry Pi models. Like, why would you be a nonprofit or? Casey and I are really together. shy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Casey and I are really shy. We're, we're not great about organizing this kind of thing. And it's, and it's kind of, it's a little bit like the, why did it take us, why did it take us 11 years to become a foundation? <laughs> you might have a better answer for that. I, you know, we've always done this project um, on the weekends, at night. Um, it's never something we are doing full time. It is something we do out of passion, and we invite other people to join us on this journey. And so um, just getting the software out in a timely way, or a year late, has been a huge struggle. Um, over the years, and just um, no ability to organize something like this outside of that. It's really the foundation um, and um, has, has enabled us to think in, in this new way. So I think now, because we were able to get it together to do it now, I think is really the, the, the answer. We, we wished, we hoped that we had done it sooner. Ben, do you have anything you want to add as we wrap up? Uh, I, I think maybe just going off of that point as well, that um, I think that's also part of what's exciting about having uh, Lauren and Dan and Johanna joining us uh, with the foundation and just the amount of energy that you, uh, you can probably imagine that Dan brings to it. And um, the perspective that uh, you know, Lauren and Johanna bring and that um, sort of the way that they've been able to expand the uh, kinds of things that we're working on and how we're thinking about it and um, really adding other dimensions to uh, you know, the project itself. And so that's um, really been a terrific development over the last couple of years. And so um, you know, we're gonna be around during the day. I hope you'll uh, you know, find us and come in and ask us questions that the whole uh, you know, point as far as uh, I'm concerned for this day is for us to um, actually get a chance to hear from you and sort of meet, you know, as Tane was saying, sort of meeting everyone in real life. And uh, we really love to, you know, hear what you're thinking about and where you'd like to go and uh, that sort of thing. So looking forward to it. All right. Thank you.